Good morning. Invite everyone to come in and take a seat, and we will begin our worship services here in just a few moments. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And if you're visiting with us, we especially want to extend a hearty welcome to you and let you know that you truly are our honored guests. And if you're looking for a church home, know that you have found one here at the Woodstock Church of Christ. If you are visiting with us, out in the foyer, there are some cards. Please uh, take one of those and fill it out and leave it with us so that we can have a record of your attendance. And if you are visiting with us, please stick around uh, as much as you possibly can so that we can get to know you and, and say hello to you. Uh, we, we want to encourage you to come back and be with us at any given time. Also, uh, we have a program of reading through the Bible each and every year. There are bookmarks. I don't know if we still have any of the May bookmarks or not, but if you don't, if you don't, if you need one and there isn't one back there, please let uh, Ellen Payne know and Payne know, and she will uh, somehow or another make make one available to you. Uh, also, if their bulletins are also in the foyer, please pick one of those up, and uh, uh, that way you've got a an idea of the things that are going on and coming up in the in the weeks uh, ahead. As a matter of some uh, timely announcements. Uh, Owen Massey is uh, having a graduation celebration on Sunday, the uh, May the 30th, between 2 and 4. I uh, want to congratulate him on his uh, accomplishment. Also, on June the 6th, there will be a high school and college graduation recognition. Uh, please make plans to attend that. If you have a cell phone, please silence that. And this morning, we will begin our worship service in song. So if you would, please stand as we begin our, our praise and our uh, worship to our Lord. Good morning. We'll start our service off with the song, Heavenly Sunlight. Mm -hmm. Let's all sing. Walking in sunlight all over my journey. now led in prayer. Let's give thanks for the day. 
Dear Heavenly Father, as we stand before you this morning, we think about how powerful and how knowing that thou art. That thou spoke this world to existence, put all the seasons in place, the animals in place, and built this world for us to live on. As we think about those things, dear Heavenly Father, we stand and tremble and think about how powerful they are and how great thy holy name is. And as we think about it, we give thanks, dear Heavenly Father, for this time when we can come to ask you for things and to thank you for things. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the day you've given us today. We thank you for the blessings that surround this day. There are many. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we'll realize that you gave them to us and that they're here because of you. We also thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your son Jesus who came and helped complete the, as you, the author and finisher of our faith so that we can have these precious promises and things that you left for us, gave us a pathway to heaven so that someday we could come home to you. We thank you for all the blessings that have you've given this church here and your congregation throughout the world. We pray that you continue to look down upon us, dear Heavenly Father, and bless us. We hope, dear Heavenly Father, there are many out there that need thy blessings, that need to come back to church, that need to set their lives straight. And maybe all of us need to examine ourselves and think about our path forward. We thank you for this time, dear Heavenly Father, where we can ask you for things. We continually ask you for your blessings. We continue to ask you to look down upon our sick list, your Heavenly Father, that's extensive. There are many people on that list that are critically ill. We've taken it back, your Heavenly Father, as people' lives end on this earth, that we could be there for them, hold their hand and comfort them in times of the straw. We pray to Heavenly Father that each one of us will step up to the task and do as much good as we can for others in the process. We ask you, dear Heavenly Father, at this time to forgive us for our sins. There's a constant struggle between right and wrong in this world. And we pray to Heavenly Father as we slip into the wrong that we'll be penitent and ask the forgiveness of our sins as we're doing this morning. We pray to Heavenly Father that as this church service goes forward that we'll do it to the best of our ability. That we'll be physically tired when we leave this place. Knowing that we've been to church and that we've worshipped our true and living God. We ask for all these things, dear Heavenly Father, in your name. Jesus' name. Amen. He'll prepare a mind for the Lord's Supper this morning. We'll sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Let's sing. Jesus, keep me
Before we start, does everyone have a communion cup? If you didn't, if you raise your hand, I sure will bring you one. We got to get it. We have a privilege as a Christian as we gather this morning to observe this communion together, the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted on the night he was betrayed. And we uh, think about that. We think about the love that God had for us, that he sent his son to this earth and let him live a, like a human and go through all the things we go through, and yet he remained perfect. And the love that he had to be in heaven with the Father and come to this earth and do what he did for us. And uh, we say we love God, but does any of us have that much love? that we would do anything like that. I mean, when we think about it, there's just no way our sin would be forgiven. There's nothing we can do. I mean, we can't be good enough. We can't do enough. All we can do is love our Father and our son, His Son and, and do everything we can to show that love. And uh, so as we think about this, would you pray with me, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, and we thank the Son for coming. And we pray that as we partake of this bread that represents that body that hang on that terrible cross, that you will be with us and guide us, and that we will do it in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, our prayer continues for this fruit of the vine that represents the Son's blood that was shed on that cruel tree and the blood that was shed before he got to the tree and the, the uh, terrible things that he went through for us and that you will be with us and that you will, we will protect this in a manner pleasing to you and that you will be with us daily in Jesus' name. As we've completed the Lord's Supper, we think a minute about our giving and the uh, reason we give is to show our love. And my feeling is that God asks for the giving, not that He needs it, but that we need it, and we need to do it. And if we can give of our pocketbook. 
then we maybe we can give ourselves to God and do what He wants us to do. So we have different ways you can do. There's ways online. You can mail it in. There's boxes in the foyer. You can drop your contribution in. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we we pray that you'll be with us and you will guide our thoughts and that we will and keep understanding that all things belong to you and we're only stewards over it and that you are dependent on us to to handle it the way that we should. And we need to need your guidance to do that and we pray that we will ask for it and we will accept it when you give it to us and that you will guide us in the things we do with the monies that are spent and they will be the further the borders of your kingdom and that they will be used wisely and we just pray for our elders as decisions are made and pray for our deacons as they help spend some of the funds and just pray for your guidance in Jesus name we pray Amen For the <clears throat> preaching this morning, we're going to sing It Is Well With My Soul. I want to tell you a little bit about this song before we sing it. Some of you may know this story, others may not, but it's worth knowing. A man named Horatio Spafford penned this song, and he was a very successful businessman in the city of Chicago. He had a lot of to, in common with Job because... First of all, he had five children, all girls except the, the one youngest was his son. At four years of age, he lost his son to pneumonia. Then, the Chicago fires took his home. And then, his business went bad. So he sent his wife and his four daughters away on a ship. And as the ship was on its travels across the Atlantic, it ran into another ship and it sank. And when uh, his wife was the only one saved, his daughter, he lost all his daughters. So after all that happened to him, he penned this song, It Is Well With My Soul. Makes it have a whole different meaning. He went on to be successful, though, because he was a good Christian man and God took care of him. If you would, let's all stand as we sing.
It's a great thing to look out over this audience as the weeks uh, come forward and notice how many are back and uh, what is being said. And, and, and especially in this uh, assembly this morning, it was a great thing to, uh, well, beginning even in Bible study, appreciate Walter so much and the work that he's put in to, to teach us and to apply the Word of God as Jesus did and as the apostles did taking things that were being taught in their day and applying them to God's Word, as Paul did when he went into the philosophers at uh, Mars Hill. And he had to deal with certain situations from the Word of God, and uh, there were some that were converted on that occasion. And there are people's minds being changed when the, when the truth is brought out, but many times that error has to be exposed. And I, I appreciate Walter so much and what he's doing and appreciate so much what has been said, Mike, in, in the explanation of it is well with my soul. Many times in these songs, uh, their songs come from their trials in life. And when we can see clearly to apply the Word of God in those situations, it, it's a great thing. And Greg, appreciate that prayer so much and how you indicated in that prayer it, it is good to be here at, at worship. And we encourage all those who have not uh, found their way back yet because uh, supposedly because of the pandemic to, uh, to, to come back now. It, it's that time. Uh, when a tornado or a hurricane sweeps down on us, we do one of two things. We either get in our cars and hightail it out of town or we hunker down and ride it out. But whatever we decide to do, there is one thing that is true in both cases. It's easy to be overcome with fear. 
And we know from the Word of God that we have not been given a spirit of timidity or of fear, but one of strength, because we know who is in control. And not until the storm subsides can we see the extent of the damage. And the storm of this pandemic now is subsiding. And we're able now to look back and we're able to notice the damage. But not just the physical damage. I want to speak today before we get back into our unity discussions and make sure that there is no spiritual damage that has been done by this physical pandemic, the virus. You know, faith is not only seen in the disaster, but faith is also seen after the disaster. What will our faith be after having experienced a disaster? Can we see growth through that? And where are we currently? Let's begin with this affirmation, with this fact. The virus is dangerous. I want us to remember that fact in the context of what all I'm going to say this morning. I don't want to come across this morning as if the virus was an oh by the way kind of thing and not that big of a deal. Some of you in this audience this morning came close to leaving this earth because of the virus. And when I observe your lives now, it's one of faith. And I appreciate what you have experienced and what you've been through. There are elderly and disabled people whose health has already been compromised and even exacerbated by the pandemic. There is no doubt that it has taken its toll. And these folks should take every precaution to guard themselves. And we all should be in this frame, this mindset together. Whether we all disagree on the degree that we need to exercise caution... The Christian principle is we defer to our brother and all we should. And by the way, for those of you that have worn masks, some are continuing to wear them, and that is absolutely fine. Those of you that have done that and perhaps gone longer with that and didn't complain and divide the fellowship over it, God bless you. It's in these kinds of situations that the glory of God can be seen when we might not agree with every particular phase of this. And I would encourage us all, don't let that mindset go away. Not only now, as we are leaving hopefully the worst of this situation, but also in other situations that would come about. To our elders in this time, I remember that when this first started, we all were talking about how unknown so much of it is. And that maybe one day we'll be able to look back on it and say, well, we did this right, maybe we could have done this better. And I remember encouraging them. I don't believe that when it is about over, we're going to be looking at, looking back at it and say, oh yeah, we definitely could have done this. You know... This shows us that God's in control. And no doubt he has allowed this to show us that we're not and that we don't know it all. And that there is no science to this whole thing at all. And for some man or some group of men to get before people and act like they know it all, they can give us their best opinions. But when it comes down to it, we just don't know. And to our elders who have led us through this, I don't know how it could have been done any better. And I appreciate them. And then for the current distress, on top of that, um, their leadership in that in that area is commendable. And I am thankful for them, 
And I am thankful for you. And I am just glad to be here today. And to see this crowd this morning uh, does my soul a whole lot of good. And as we've sung, no matter what else happens, Mike, no matter what else happens in our lives, if we can say, it is well with our soul, then what better thing could we say? And many of us meant that song this morning. Not only as it was first written by the gentleman from Chicago who lost it all like Job. There are many things that we lose in this life. Those that are near and dear to us. But don't ever escape the fact that you can say it is well with your soul during a pandemic or anything else. God bless this church. For lots of reasons. So, having said that, having laid the context of my next, uh, or of the rest of this lesson, what I'm about to say is not directed to the, the elderly, those that are physically compromised in any way. And I want you to know that. But the ones that I am targeting this morning, the ones that I do have in mind, are the ones now that seemingly can go to the supermarkets, they can go to work, they can go to school, they can go to restaurants, but for some reason they can't be in the assembly of the saints. Every week, or about every week, Ellen gives me a list of those who have not been able to get back because of the pandemic. And this week, that list numbers 81 people. 81. I looked over that list, and I noticed the ones who have been physically compromised. And I also look at that list with this in mind. That list only includes those that have not been back at a service since the pandemic began. There are others that have been back only a time or two. My encouragement to you this morning is to now get over that fear. Keep yourself guarded as much as you need to be, but streaming a service online does not compare to the text that Joseph just read this morning from Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to see that this morning. There are some that have pre-existing conditions spiritually that does not allow them to come back now. And they're using the pandemic as an excuse not to be back. And that's pretty obvious. There was some unfaithfulness before the pandemic and it is occurring after the pandemic but not because of the pandemic. As we said, the pandemic has exacerbated some physical conditions. But we cannot allow it to exacerbate spiritual unfaithfulness. Even if those things are subconscious. In 2019, I recall that the India missions team were coming back from India... And we heard of reports that were coming out of Wuhan, China, that there was a virus going on. And uh, the height of that talk began, or at least as we could ascertain, while we were in India. And we came back to Atlanta, came into the airport, and were greeted with a lot of people wearing funny masks. Little did we know at that time that that would become a major part of our lives. But as we began to get that knowledge, one of these songs, like It Is Well With My Soul, frequently came to mind, and we were going to be seen through it one way or another. It was going to be good one way or another. The Woodstock Church of Christ closed its doors for worship and remained closed for approximately three months. And now, we have made progress and are continuing to make progress. And what is so fascinating about all of this is that there are similarities of this very situation as have occurred before. Very interesting similarities. 
I was reading an article recently from uh, a recent issue of the Gospel Advocate and the writers of the Gospel Advocate were indicating how this is not the first time the Gospel Advocate had to close because of worldwide conditions. The Gospel Advocate began to be published in 1855, just a few year, uh, years preceding the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln had been elected president. And the first year that he was elected, 11 states seceded from the Union. South Carolina was the first on December 26th of 1860. And Tennessee was the last on June 8th of 1861. The South Carolina militia attacked the federal outpost at Fort Sumter on April 12th, 1861, and war came rapidly. How it affected the gospel advocate was soon evident. And by 1860, Nashville had become a well-functioning, significant city. It had, listen to this, it had five daily newspapers and it had eight religious publications, some of those religious publications, enjoying a greater readership than the daily newspaper. It's later than we think, brethren. The Gospel Advocate was one of those eight religious papers that were being well circulated in Nashville. By 1861, February of that year, the Federal Army had moved into Nashville and by February the 24th, 1862, the city was under federal control. The impact on city life was widespread. Federal control demanded that citizens take a loyalty oath to the U.S. government. Many refused. One result was the shutting down of the schools. Other curtailments included the railway system, limited travel, religious gatherings to a large degree ceased, publicly speaking. The saloons were closing. The businesses were being stifled. Economic growth was not as it should be. There was a disruptive presidential election. Sound familiar? And not only that, guess what pandemic broke out? Who knows? Yes, smallpox. Eerily similar, don't you think? A virus that caused thousands of Americans to lose their lives. Well, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and let our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now keep in mind these next verses. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. How do we do that? You don't do it by live streaming. It's interesting that this next verse doesn't say don't neglect worship, even though that's what it has in mind. It, says, it doesn't say don't neglect just coming to church. It says don't neglect to meet together as the habit was being developed by those 
who received the Hebrew letter. There were situations in life that were keeping them from coming together whether they could live stream a service or not. God in his infinite wisdom knew that humans depended on close-knit fellowship for their spiritual existence. I think over my life and how my life has been influenced just by meeting with the church. The impact that that has and continues to have on my life and on your life is immense. And it's something that I can't get at home viewing a service. And that's what the let us phrases in this text is telling us. I can't stir you up to love and good works when I'm, I, I'm at my home watching a service. And that's why God does not want us to neglect what we're doing here. Are there circumstances that would demand us missing a time of meeting? Of course. And that's not what's under consideration here. You see the word habit? They were not coming together because they developed a habit of not meeting together. Whether for a seemingly good reason or not. To be sure, I am thankful that we have technology to bring worship experiences into our homes. But if I think that that's the long-term goal for my relationship with God as it comes to worship, I am sorely and sadly mistaken. We depended on that in our home for a time, and I'm thankful that we could. But all the while... How much did you miss being here? Some that aren't here even today are still answering that question. And by the way, we are so glad if this is your first time back that you are here. Live streaming has its upside, but I want you to consider this scenario and I want you to compare it with the scenario you experienced when you worshiped online. We preset the TV to record the service. We sleep till noon. We get up and pour a cup of coffee, drag the kids into the living room, still in their PJs. We turn on the, the service. We worship for a few minutes and then we press pause and pour another cup of coffee, maybe make something to eat, break up a fight amongst the kids, and then turn the TV back on and listen a little more, then push pause again to answer a phone call. We take communion, but with so many disruptions, I'm not sure we could say that we even worship in spirit. And those, perhaps, that were more disciplined... Say you and your spouse and the children got up earlier. And can I even say this phrase anymore, got dressed for worship? Do we dress anymore for worship? You see the attitudes that are behind it? It's not just about a shirt and tie. It's not what this is about. It's about attitude. And you see how Satan can take a relatively good thing like live streaming a service... And he can instill in the kids when they say to mom and dad, Mom and dad, well, we worship God for a year like this. You know, I'm getting pretty used to it. And God bless each one of these young people that are here this morning, by the way. Don't fall into Satan's trap that worshiping home substitutes for what you're doing today. It doesn't. Satan has a history of taking good things and repurposing them to suit his agenda. He quoted scripture many times. So just a quotation of scripture after scripture is not necessarily dealing with the issues of the day. The Lord had to go further with that. In fact, Satan may be looking at families right now that aren't here, that need to be here, and working on them in this fashion. After the pandemic, 
subsides. We announce to the children, we're going back to the assembly next week. But, but mom, I'd rather stay home. We did it this way. It worked. It worked. It worked. It worked according to who? The scripture that I read says it doesn't work long term. What we may find out is that Satan has subtly rearranged our thinking. You know, the thinking that's always kind of been there. You know, in, in Matthew 18 when someone decides to neglect the assembly and they go out on the fishing boat and then Satan through them quotes, well, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with them. Not exactly the spirit of the passage, is it? In fact, not even dealing with worship. But see how Satan does that. And Satan can take this pandemic and the gains that we could have made through the pandemic in increasing our faith and actually decreasing it. Well, what does your faith look like after the pandemic? Do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. I can't encourage you when I'm at home worshiping online. Have you ever heard this exhortation before from Hebrews 10? If you've been in the church uh, uh, at any length at all, you've heard it plenty of times. In fact, sometimes it's been stated so much that there are some that wish we would just leave it alone. But of course, we can't do that either. This statement is found in a book whose recipients were leaving Christ. And this was part of the piece in the puzzle of noticing how they were forsaking Christ by forsaking his assembly, his assembling. And it is vital to the individual Christian about the value that should be placed on our meeting together. That's why we want it holy and reverent. That's why we want to separate it. We're worshiping a holy God. We are in a holy time separate from all other events. That's why we think differently. That's why we dress differently. That's why we do so many things differently. And that's why we don't bring coffee in and come dressed in our PJs and try to worship God that way. He's a holy God. He's not a common God, as we would do common things in our lives. There is something that God wants us to view as rich, yet complex and simple, about the person and work of Jesus. The common people heard him gladly, but common service to him is not acceptable at all. Out of all the things the book of Hebrews promises us regarding Jesus, the main thing that is promised to us is that we have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. And so, yes, the Lord is in his assembly in a, in a, in a special way. And that's why we make it special. Trying to worship outside of the assembling is not what God desires. Sometimes necessary, sometimes, but few and far between the times when we can be here. But it's all, it's attitudinal, isn't it? It's attitudinal. I want us to notice from this text that there are certain points about it that show what falling away means. And when we look at, first of all, we, we notice the communication. Oh yes, there's a communication that happens here. There is a type of communication that happens at home when we worship. And so we have seen the difference in that first point of communication. But notice in the second point here, we have the conclusion. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is, don't neglect meeting together. What motivates that? Well, it's a lack of commitment. Let us draw near. Let us draw near to God. How is that done? 
It's not like the only place that we draw near to God is in the assembly, but in all of life, what place do you draw nearer any better than the assembly? God knew that. God knew that from the very beginning. If Christ has made a way, it just makes sense that we should take advantage of that opportunity. Jesus promised that if we draw near to God, then what will he do to us? He'll draw near to us. If we absent ourselves from God, whether publicly or privately, then what is the case? That is why we feel that God is not near us. Because we have not exercised our spirit, our mind, to draw near to God. And the assembling on the first day of the week has become so common to us that we treat it as we would any other assembly in which we might engage during the rest of the week. It is different. And the ways that we can show in our lives that it is different, then that is going to enable us to draw nearer to God. How many times, nearer my God to thee? Jesus, keep me near the cross, we sang as well today. How are you going to keep near the cross of Jesus? And, how, and what better way do you do that than when we come together? This is a special time on a special day, not the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, for a special purpose. Is this assembly the most special thing that you do in your week? If it is, and we all know that we should answer that in the affirmative, then why would we neglect it any time? Why does this verse even have to be in Scripture if we have applied the rest of Scripture? This should automatically follow. But God knows that sometimes we don't act consistently with the way that we think. And we put going out of town and vacations and everything before assembling. And so when we have all these reasons why we neglect it, then no wonder it's going to be habitual and it gets easier and easier to neglect. Even through a process called live streaming. Satan would like no better than to convince all of us here this morning that you don't have to be here and you can do it at home. Just another way of making this experience common. Common. But secondly, he says, not only let us draw near, but let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Isn't this interesting that he says this in the light of don't neglect coming together? The fastest way for us to draw back and stop approaching God is to lose confidence in the hope that brought us here in the first place. Where else do you get the encouragement to hang in there than in what we're doing today? Holding fast our confession means we remind ourselves daily that we come to God in and through Jesus Christ. And we sustain that hope by continually reminding each other that he is faithful to keep his promise until the end. And don't you think we need that during a pandemic? Don't you, need, we, don't you think we need to thank God for how he has seen us through? The very fact that we still are breathing, as we've learned in Bible class, that is dependent upon a non-contingent being. That we can't even give each other. That only happens to come from God. But in the third place, the Hebrew writer says, let us consider how to stir up who? One another. When I think of the times I had to worship online, you know what I think I miss the most? Is you stirring me up. That can't be done at home. Or at least it can't be done watching a service. He calls us to stir up one another to love and good verse. Which is a call to be an encouragement to remain faithful. And to continue to walk this walk. Now, with all of that text in mind. The scriptures then make this famous call. Don't neglect coming together. Don't forsake the assembling. The New King James would say. And this is a command. Whether we want to hear it in command form or not, it is a command. It is in the imperative mood. 
The journey to heaven can be had through this avenue. And there are many reasons people would have to miss a church service, and we've enumerated them. Thinking of a military person leaving another soldier on the battlefield to defend himself. A good soldier wouldn't do that. And a good soldier at Christ does not neglect being with his fellow soldiers in Christ in the worship of God. We see the value placed on the assembly. Considering the importance of drawing near to Christ, of exhorting one another, and on and on it can go throughout all of Scripture. It guides us on how to best use this specific command. So what will it be when we consider the pandemic and the gains made from it? Have we learned from it? Or have we taken a step back? That part of the story is going to continue to unfold as we live day by day. And so I would, in order to fulfill my part, encouraging all of us, and drawing near to God, and provoking each other to love and good works, don't let us ever forget the main foundation of all of that. And based on that, don't neglect assembling. And don't neglect it to the point where it becomes habitual. Just like any sin, right? Just like any sin. It's the habitual sin that will cause the blood, that will cause God not to draw near to us. That it doesn't have that ability to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But since we do have the blood of Jesus, we have another opportunity to ask for its cleansing. And if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you have not allowed the worship, the plan of salvation to be holy in your mind, to be set apart from everything else in life, you need to be encouraged to do that, even this very time. We're going to sing an invitation song designed for that very purpose, and we hope that you will listen to it well, as we all do. And perhaps we all can respond to heaven's invitation, be brought closer to him and to one another through this wonderful assembly that he has made possible for us. Let's stand and sing together. The great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the grooving heart to cheer, oh, hear the voice of Jesus. Sweet is the seraph song, sweet is name on mortal tongue, sweet I hope uh, everyone had an opportunity to get a bulletin as you came in. Uh, lots of information in there uh, that you need to know. And uh, hopefully uh, also you have signed up for our emails that we send out daily, our prayer lists and uh, reminders and things like that. It just gives us a great opportunity to serve one another uh, here in this congregation. 
I do have a couple of things I'd like to add uh, to the bulletin. I have a letter here uh, from Bob and Kathy Putnam that I'd like to read. Uh, it says, to our brothers and sisters at the Woodstock Church of Christ. And then uh, there's a verse here, Mark 12, 30 through 31, and it reads, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all of your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The love that has been shown to Kathy and I during this difficult time in our life with the loss of our son Cole is just as Jesus directed. Your many kind words, your beautiful cards, and the hydrangea plant are such symbols of the depth of your love for not only us, but for so many amongst us who are in need of prayer, support, or who have pain and grief. Your unwavering love continues to lift us up through these troubled waters as we look towards brighter days. Thank you for all, all of the prayers, the written words, the tears, the hugs, pats on the back, and the touches of a hand, each one showing your love for God and for us and each other. Please know that just as you have loved us, we're loving you right back, and we will always be there for you. Signed, Bob and Kathy Putnam. Bob and Kathy, you know we love you, and we're continuing to pray for you every day. We have another note here uh, from uh, the Jones. Uh, Julie Jones' younger brother, uh, Scott Bomar, uh, had a heart attack yesterday, uh, but he's in stable condition in the hospital. I believe uh, John said he was in North Carolina. So uh, continue to remember uh, him in your prayers. Uh, also, uh, did, I haven't seen them this morning, but maybe they're here. Uh, Clint and Carrie Hines, are you here? Oh, there they are. If I can get them to stand up, they placed membership with us uh, this week. And I uh, just want to welcome uh, them to the congregation here at Woodstock. And uh, just uh, looking forward to working uh, with them here at this place. Thank y'all. Y'all get to meet them after church if you haven't, or service rather. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, also, before we have a prayer, and uh, I believe I can speak for all the elders, and I just want to thank this congregation uh, for the support that you've given us over the last few weeks. Um, your support's always important, uh, but the cards and the calls and the comments have uh, been especially cherished lately, and um, I just wanted to say thank you to each and every one of you for that. I appreciate it. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for the opportunity that we've had to worship you. And Father, we pray that we'll never take the ability to gather peaceably for granted. We know that as times grow worse and worse, that uh, this may not always be the case. But we pray for strength that we'll always be faithful no matter what. Father, we thank you for this congregation and we thank you for the love and the support that we find here. We thank you for the kindness and the love, the compassion that is shown in so many ways during times of sickness and struggle and loss. Father, this congregation surrounds uh, those who are in the midst of these trying times, and we thank you for that. Father, we thank you that you established the church for our benefit, to help us get through the day-to-day -day struggles of this life. Father, we thank you again for this congregation, and we pray that it will always stand firm on your word. Father, we know that there are those of our number who are facing struggles right now, and we pray that you be with each of these and that you work in each of these situations and give them all the things that they need to recover. Father, we pray this morning for Julie's brother, Scott, as he recovers from his heart attack, and we pray for the doctors and the nurses that are tending to his medical needs. Father, we pray that you give them wisdom and skill, and we pray that his recovery will be complete. Father, we continue to pray for Bob and Kathy uh, during the time of the loss of Cole, and we pray for their peace and their well-being. We pray for their healing. Father, we thank you that Clint and Carrie have decided to work and worship with us here at Woodstock, and we pray that we'll strengthen them and that they will be a strength to us. Father, that we'll all grow together in obedience and service to you. And Father, we pray that we'll all work towards heaven together and that we'll spend an eternity together with you. 
Father, now we thank you for your son Jesus. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that he brings into our lives, the comfort and the peace and the love and the salvation. Father, we just thank you. We can't thank you enough for his sacrifice. Father, we pray now that you forgive us of our sins. Father, we pray that as we depart this place that you'll protect us and keep us till we return. And Father, that we'll be a shining example to those around us. Father, once again, thank you for your love. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Mike will lead us in one more song and we'll be dismissed. You would let's all stand as we sing when the roll is called up yonder. I like this song because I have memories of standing in the back floorboard going to church and hearing my mom and daddy sing this on the way to church. Let's sing. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saints on earth shall gather over on the other shore And the road is called the yonder I'll be there When the road is called the yonder When the road is called the yonder Thanks.